Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. We are offering three separate conversations from Wednesday night's episode, 14 Variable Machine Learning Model Identifies Probable Nash Patients from Electronic Health Records. Not our most concise title to date, eh? In this conversation, the surfers, Louise Campbell, Jorn Schottenberg, our guest Chris Cowdley, and I discuss proper uses of the model today and in the future. We focus on a short-term objective, identifying a large group of patients who may be eligible for NASH clinical trials, and a long-term objective, streamlining the diagnostic and testing processes for patients who may have NASH and getting them the care they need a little faster. NASH map is a special tool, the leading edge of our future. You'll want to know about it. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, Join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion groups. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Professor Yarn Schottenberg, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guest, hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Chris Cowdley, as they discuss Professor Schottenberg's recent paper on machine learning and NASH diagnosis. This week, on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. The first is we know that uh, ethnicity or race is a very big driver of likelihood of finding NASH in an at-risk patient. How was that accounted for in the Optum database, and how do you utilize that in a model of this sort? And then the second question, which really is something that I've struggled with for quite a long time, is that when you develop these non-invasive tools to identify patients at risk for a particular disease, the performance characteristics of of the test is very much dependent on the prevalence of the disease in the population that you're studying. So for example, I feel pretty confident that in the NIDDK cohort, the prevalence of NASH, you know, and, and in fact it was, I think uh, two thirds of the patients in the NIDDK cohort actually had NASH. So what I struggle with, with whether it's FIB4 or other non-proprietary tests, or even if it's something like elastography, et cetera, how are these tests going to hold up when and we start to broadcast them in large EHRs and with low prevalences of disease, will they still hold up and how do we fine tune that to make them more useful? Yeah, very important points, Chris. And um, I, the, the genetic aspects are, I'm not aware how it is captured in NADDK, but it didn't come up as a signal for sure. It wasn't included in the analysis, so it was not accounted for in this algorithm. And it's nothing we explored in depth in the paper. So uh, whether a genetic background is as a contributor here. So that's not available in this. The second point is well taken and the pretest probability does influence the performance characteristics. Absolutely agree. I'd love to wrap my head or that algorithm around and you know a, a database with a much lower pretest probability, different settings. So if you're listening in, you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out. What I can say at this point is that the performance between patients with type 2 diabetes and those without type 2 diabetes wasn't much different. And we've actually subsequently looked into a study database uh, for diabetes trials. So this is all diabetes patients. And here the algorithm actually identified patients that were more insulin resistant in a group with all insulin resistant and identified them as probable NASH. So I think there is certain tweaks that these 14 variables have to move or identify patients even outside of obvious high risk constellations. And I mentioned the five features already. If you if you expand it to the 14 features, um, you'll find that height, platelets, and hematocrit, um, and this 14th uh, variable, the gender, uh, is coming in. So I think it has some tools to even identify patients in lower risk populations. Jorn, this, this might be um, the weakest question of the afternoon, but uh, I was struck by some of the variables that were lower on the gradient. And kind of specifically, I was wondering if there was a hypothesis about the role that height played. Gender is another independent variable further down the list, and BMI is there also, which means height has to have some kind of independent value, and I, I couldn't figure out exactly how that would piece together. You know the whole data set, I'm wondering. We've discussed it at length, too. I mean, height is a variable within BMI, so does it make sense to take that variable twice? That was my first question uh, when I saw that. But in the end, the machine put that out, and, and 
and it has additional uh, value if, if you put this in. We actually tested the algorithm and tried to reduce it to five features. Um, if you bring it up to 24 features, it doesn't become much better. So the 14 features is, is the break point where it was good. How does the height come in? It's just... I think it stresses the importance of body composition and BMI and the height showing up here shows us that this is something that's just very closely related with the probability of having NASH. First of all, you know, if you're in multivariate stats, you know, in my background. So that piece of the methodology, I was a huge fan of. We did a bunch of bootstrapping and bagging in our business and we're just starting to flirt with XG Boost when we decided I decided I don't want to be in marketing research anymore. So the methodology made tons of sense to me. And it's clear that height is an independent very I mean, you can take a look at down at the bottom where the relative strength of hypertension is 16% or gender is 12%. And you can say, gee, that's not adding a ton. But the relative strength of height, certainly independent of the BMI, is powerful enough. So it would be interesting to know if there are other correlates to height outside of this model that might shed further light onto why that matters. So I was also struck by the idea that in the 14 feature model, AST was number two, ALT was number three, and the AST-ALT ratio was number five. I'm sure you dug into that one because those are really powerful uh, predictors. What was the independent value of the ratio aside from the value of the ind individual scores, or why were the individual scores so high given the predictive power of the ratio? I, I've tried to, to discuss this biologically. In the end, it's the machine taking events, looking at events, and selecting which variables are most robustly correlated with that. And, and why does AST pop up before ALT? It's interesting because we think NASH is more inflammatory, you'd, you'd, you'd be looking at ALT, AST, ALT ratio goes towards cirrhosis, but we're not aiming to detect cirrhosis here. I don't have the full final answer. It's just, um, I think it's plausible we're, we're talking about an inflammatory liver disease to have these tests up very high on the list. I'm sure that's right. I'm a big believer that the statistics tell you what they tell you. And one of the things about machine learning is that it draws patterns that you intuitively wouldn't think were right, as you just pointed out about AST and ALT. The fact that they're both so high up says to me, I don't really care which one's high might have something to do with diabetics since HbA1c is the first one on the list. But I guess I'm wondering how much can we learn about the liver or theories about the liver by looking at this pattern and also understanding what variables weren't included or did not make the cut that would tell us either things that we didn't know previously or give us different ways of looking at things. Yeah, well, the one that struck me again very prominently is total protein. It's up in the list in number four in that importance rank. Uh, again, you highlighted it in the paper. There's a table where you can see the relative contribution or the relative feature importance and total protein has 71%. And total protein is probably one of those values that's n not even routinely always measured in all uh, liver clinics. But it's about nutrition and it's about liver function and a biological. There are many plausible ways how I could uh, link this to the disease inflammatory phenotype or fibrotic phenotype. And this is the only downside. Maybe I have to understand machine learning a little better, but to a certain extent, it, it's a black box mechanism where it takes the available data and gives you an output. And then you can delete certain valuables and see how well it does and then still separating those cases. But I'm, I, I'm not convinced that this time that it will tell us something about the disease. It's more, you know, it's also influenced about which features are captured in the data set. And I think the most important learning for me was the models are only as good as the data that goes into the models. That's been the history of EHR. I think that's right. I was just thinking when you were talking about BMI and height, and then what Chris was saying, that if we take this data set and we put it in an Asian population, BMI is, is different. And the de de definition of high BMI is different. And height, often they have a BMI and and they're shorter, they're not as tall. So again, in an enriched demographic where they may have a very high probability of having an and nash BMI may not be as indicative in that population. And it's generally a poor marker. We had a, an article out in the press last week, the BMI encourages eating disorder because people actually don't trust it. They don't believe it. And everybody's body composition is different. So maybe more enriched populations. And we don't take the best data in hospitals. We take general data. BMI being one of them rather than a body composition data set in high risk populations. So I just wondered that draws in Chris's question about ethnicity. And it's an important one and you don't let me get off the hook here. So I went into the supplementary materials and had to look it up myself. And uh, actually we're there, we, we were uh, we we're saying that or we identified it, it's it's 70% non-Hispanic in the national, 30% Hispanic. And if I look into the breakdown of races, it's only 3% African-American, 4% Indian-American, 5% 
Asian, 80% white. So this is uh, something that will not allow for in-depth analysis in different ethnicities. Again, you, I think you'd have to go there and look at those data uh, and see how a, a model that's built in a US population like this um, would perform. And even in Germany, I haven't done it yet. We'll have to uh, have to study that. That's a good point. Jorn, one of the things I take out of this, though, is it is possible to build a model, even in an enriched data set, if you can get here over time, you can start to figure out things like if you can get large enough subpopulations, you can figure out what does and doesn't work in the subpopulations. Machine learning isn't, well, it is what it is. As you say, it takes things out of a black box, but usually variables that are there represent something you understand, right? So HbA1c would be about insulin resistance. AST, ALT, and the ratio would, would be about the liver protein, would be about the diet. BMI would be about obesity. You, you can go down and you can say, okay, I understand what most of these things represent and why this measure represents that as compared to a different measure. Was there anything you would have expected to see in this when you started that isn't here or isn't really represented by what is here? The age, I guess, is something that I normally consider important in my clinics, but it's multidimensional. I mean, I, that goes into how intensively do I counsel the patient and so on. I, I think age is a risk factor for NASH. It didn't show up here. I, I, I don't remember where it knocked out. I think it was in the first 24th, but that's something that I, in clinics, is very important to me and that the machine didn't come up with here. That in itself is interesting because we, we have a preconceived idea that the older you get, the greater your risk because of that longevity. But we're seeing now more and more children and adolescents with fatty liver disease. And I think I come across people regularly that go to the gym that have blood tests that suggest fatty liver disease all over them, look good on the outside, but eat a really poor diet and you can measure it on the inside. So that preconception, and I think this, this is where a lot of primary care physicians, a lot of other physicians come in to, I know what I'm looking for before I find it. And that happens in lots of areas of liver disease, whether it's viral hepatitis, people have a, a fixed idea of demographics. So it, it is interesting that age didn't come up because, of course, machines aren't biased in that way. They just take the data. Yeah. And I guess the second thing you could discuss that there should be more lipids in there. I mean, there's only the triglycerides that made the cut and uh, no HDL, LDL or cholesterol. And I think, does that mean that metabolism is uh, in this context not as important i think if you if you ask me what do i learn from the model it's tweaked a little bit towards again that nutrition many liver aspects diabetes is the highly ranked or the hba1c but then again it's not only about diabetes it works as well in non-diabetic patients and it's not always choosing the same cutoff as i tried to explain in the tree building concept it uses different cutoffs uh, and, it, and and much more differentiated than as a clinician uh, when i look at it i also think that the fact that there's not not a lot of discussion about ethnicity or race or even alcohol consumption in this type of database, but still producing a useful tool will allow us to identify those patients at greater risk without getting distracted into other types of risk behaviors that clearly need to be modified, but may not necessarily be the root cause of the problem. And finally, I think this will be a huge tool that will change the thinking of our endocrine colleagues and our primary care colleagues who historically still will only think about liver disease in a patient with an elevated ALT. And I think that uh, broadening the scope to focus first and foremost on insulin resistance, followed by features of necroinflammation, and then followed by tools that measure nutritional status, in some ways will change our thinking about how we identify patients who are at risk for NASH and really bring the focus back to the brute cause uh, which is, you know, visceral fat, peripheral lipolysis, and insulin resistance as being the greatest first hits, if you will, that initiate this cascade. Thanks, Chris. Jorn, you want to comment on that? And then I have a couple of questions. No, I think, uh, Chris, thank you for, for summarizing it. Many things I could have only echoed. I, I agree, and I'm happy you pointed these out. To follow up on your on your thoughts on, on identification of patients with predominantly alcoholic liver disease, I mean, you've been, uh, you've been in this field much longer than I have. And, and, and you've seen your share. But I think personally, I have become fairly comfortable in identifying patients that have a predominant alcoholic liver disease. There's one or and there's some that, that, that you don't get your head around. But I think physicians in general are, they know there's a whole discussion of how can you exclude it. I, I think physicians are fairly good at, at that. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. 
We are releasing two other conversations from this episode. Please join the discussion on our LinkedIn and Facebook discussion group to talk more or ask questions. Next week, we will post daily episodes Wednesday and Thursday evenings from the 4th Global Nash Congress. And we'll be back on our regular schedule the following week. I hope you'll join us next week for the Nash Congress. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.